Well, I want to welcome everybody to Looney's this evening. Uh, this is the fifth presentation that uh, the Kuchichi Museums has done with our History on Tap series. And our subject tonight is uh, nightlife in Borderland, whiskey, wagers, and women. Uh, my name is Mike Williams, president of the Kuchichi Museums. And to my left is Ashley Levine and Bern Johnson. Uh, as a reminder, I do this for every one of our presentations, is that the bar here at Looney's remains open. This is not a lecture, you know, it's a discussion. So the bar remains open, so please give Looney's a business. Uh, again, we have a free will offering here. Any support uh, for the museum is much appreciated. And also, we're filming again, so if you do go by here back and forth to the bar, don't kind of dally out front, please. And we also have, uh, available here at the museum's are, uh, SPM tap uh, t-shirts and um, sweatshirts. And I'm going to start with uh, the senior part of uh, nightlife in Borderland, <clears throat> beginning in the early part of the 20th century and then continuing on to uh, a few years after the repeal of Prohibition. I'm going to quote from a 1913 newspaper ad, and I do quote, International Falls is the liveliest town in Minnesota. Saloons run day and night. Gambling is wide open with no restrictions. This makes a good town and a good place to buy property and double your money. Well, I don't know who they were advertising for, but <laughs> great statement. But indeed, uh, International Falls in the surrounding area at that time was uh, in the midst of an economic boom. The dam, and, the dam and paper mills were built, sawmills were prospering, and literally thousands of men were working in the woods. An example, the Virginia Rainy Lake Lumber Company, that was based out of Cousin, Minnesota, had 4,724 men working at its peak, and a dozen of camps in all the area. And that was just one company. E.W. Baptist uh, also employed thousands. And at leisure time, for all of these people, there was a great demand for what we've always referred to as the three companions, alcohol, gambling, and uh, prostitution. <laughs> Thus, our program tonight, whiskey, wagers, and women. Uh, there were many, many more than willing to supply that demand. 1910, International Falls had 24 licensed saloons, and uh, Little Rainier had four. And besides selling liquor, gamblers and prostitutes uh, operated uh, freely in the establishment, and of course some of the ladies out on the street. Uh, the government entities coveted the uh, license fees that they charged these establishments. Uh, $500 was kind of a beginning fee that it went up. But in those days, $500 would uh, build a mile of road in Kuchichin County. So it made sense for the establishments not only to uh, raise price, but, but to increase the number. However, with all the drunken and lewd behavior going on 24 hours a day, uh, one letter to the editor stated, and I'll quote, such an amount for license would pay for a whole mile of road in Kuchichin County and 50 miles towards hell. <laughs> But in an effort to uh, reduce the number of liquor licenses, in 1914, the state of Minnesota passed a law prohibiting counties from granting liquor licenses to any establishment outside of city limits. Oddly enough, this continued until 1968. However, at that same year, 1914, the citizens of International Falls voted 539 wet and 242 dry. The dryers were upset, of course, but stated that their mission to bring prohibition in was uh, not over. Enforcement of the existing liquor laws was lax. And this was proven on April 17, 1916, when Alderman Frank Lang of the International Falls City Council made a motion at the council meeting that unlicensed, that's unlicensed, liquor establishments be closed but it failed due to a lack of a second. <laughs> uh, the ringleader of the lawlessness of International Falls at that time was Mayor Frank Keyes. He was re-elected in March of 1917 by a wide margin. 
However, and I find this almost unbelievable, in October of that year, the governor of Minnesota, J.A. Bernquist, removed Frank Keyes, Sheriff Thomas White, and Rainier Mayor Pete Gibbons from office for dereliction of duty and failure to enforce laws. You imagine if that happened today, if uh, Bob Anderson and, and Bimble Wagner and Karen Helen were removed from office by the governor, I, I believe it would make the 530 news. <laughs> Oddly enough, they reinstated the following year, but by then, 1917, the state of Minnesota became dry. But uh, that didn't change anything on the border. Licensed soft drink parlors and blind pigs continued in the liquor business, and bootleg liquor and smuggled liquor from Canada continued to be easily available. Well, I'm not sure if, if any of you, I know we've all heard of the phrase blind pig, but how it originated. Um, a person would enter a, an establishment that uh, had advertised that they had an oddity, let's say a blind pig. And if you paid a quarter, you could go in and see the pig. And uh, as a reward for that, you got a complimentary glass of whiskey. For another quarter, you could see the pig again, and it's gone all night. <laughs> but I love the quotes from Billy Noonan. He was uh, the editor of, uh, of the Vedette region. He's quoted that prohibition is working well on the border, except there is more drinking than ever before. <laughs> But unless the liquor that was consumed uh, was fine, smuggled Canadian whiskey from Canada, the quality of the, of the liquor was often questionable. Again, I have a Billy Noonan quote. Gasoline is 19 cents a gallon, hair tonic is $1.50 a bottle, and bootleg liquor, $5 a quart. And it makes no difference. They all taste the same. <laughs> I have quite a sense of humor. But with the passage of the Volstead Act in 1919, the whole United States entered, which we all know called prohibition. Uh, now bootleg uh, Canadian and bootleg uh, whiskey and smuggled Canadian liquor from Canada was big business on a national scale, and this would continue until the repeal of prohibition in 1933. The three companions, alcohol, gambling, and prostitution, continued on the border, but nothing ever happened. Uh, residents of International Falls, to escape this tough element that was going on 24 hours a day, would often travel to Fort Francis to, uh, for dining and entertainment. But my grandfather, Bob Williams, was heavily involved in all of this, the liquor business. Also, upon his arrival here in the uh, right here in 1918, uh, he not only had skills scattered around the area, but uh, also smuggled fine Canadian whiskey in from Canada. Uh, he, in fact, he was called uh, the ringleader of the whole operation around here by Jess Rose, who was head of customs. I should add that my grandfather, through all of this, for all of those years, was never arrested or caught for anything. He also uh, operated houses of ill repute both here in Rainier and at Kettle Falls. And in doing research on this, I, I read a book that was called The Beef Trust. My grandfather apparently had four rather heavy women working for him here in the main year and had a combined weight of over a thousand pounds. <laughs> That's the beef trust. Uh, slot machines and gambling were part of his operations. And I, and I remember my dad uh, telling me once that when he was a little boy, he was playing one of my grandpa's slot machines in one of his establishments. He received a sharp kick in the rear end. And uh, it was my grandfather. He, he said, Charlie, don't ever play these, these games. Uh, these machines are fixed. You'll never, ever make any money. <laughs> that ended my, my dad's career as a gambler. But my dad also told me about what would happen at Kettle Falls when a, when a log drive would come through. Uh, the lumberjacks would be paid, I check by the company, and in order to cash those checks, they'd have to go to the hotel. Population of 120 at that time in Kettle Falls, but the hotel was, was my grandpa was the only place that would be able to cash checks. But they'd be charged at 
premium. And my grandpa then would split that 50-50 with the bookkeeper. Uh, lumberjack then, of course, would spend time in the bar, and most likely upstairs, you know, what's going on there. And he could also waste uh, time and money with uh, the slot machines. Uh, if he passed out, his pockets were empty. And they had something in common at the end of the day or the next day that all of them would be hung over and broke. But I have to talk about one incident that, that uh, I, I read about in the past. But remember my dad telling me this story, what happened at Kill Falls. Lumberjack, Kicker Lumberjack, had drank himself you know, to the point of uh, nearly passing out. And he was uh, escorted to a small room that adjoined the bar at the, at the old hotel at Kill Falls to sleep it off. Well, the bouncer at that time, of course, once the guy did fall asleep, would, uh, would roll him. He would, he would uh, empty his pockets. But whoever, every time that he peeked in the room at the guy, the guy would be looking at him. So this went on all night. But then in the morning, Lumberjack got up and went to the bar and ordered a glass of water. And he popped out his glass eye and washed it and water and said, all night uh, the bouncer was looking at that open glass eye. So uh, hopefully he was able to keep some of the cash in the hotel staff, I guess, at that time, that quite a laugh out of it. But uh, our borderland continued to uh, retain the frontier mentality through the 1920s. Lawlessness was common, enforcement was really, really busy, but always seemed to be far behind. Bootleg liquor uh, led to some uh, murders and actually quite a few suicides. But the quality of the liquor kind of depended on the person who made it. Uh, some was watered down, pretty weak. Some had dangerous additives added to it, like wood alcohol or formaldehyde or even embalming fluid, you can imagine that. Some was called uh, kill em quick liquor. And I remember another one was called uh, Old Stump Horror. And some was referred to as Block and Tackle. It was said that after several sips, if you could knock a block, you could tackle anything. <laughs> but eventually, by the late 1920s, things began to change. Uh, the pine forests were depleted, sawmills with thousands of uh, lumberjacks uh, went away. Uh, the Great Depression, of course, cost jobs, cut payrolls. E.W. Backus, his mills stayed open, but uh, were in receivership. And of course, like I said earlier, the wages were way down. But there was a new kid on the block was starting to come up, and that was tourism. The prohibition ended in the United States in 1933. In certain places like uh, Second Street, International Falls, remained as tough places. You know, but generally, lawlessness was leaving. But after Prohibition, my grandfather's nightclub, called the Williams Nightclub, and I think there's some photos of information over here on it, operated here in Rainier until it burned in February of 1942. Uh, it was located on the exact spot where the Rainier Post Office is now. And it was a very, very popular place for uh, people from both International Falls and Fort Francis. He brought in numerous acts uh, for entertainment, and you'll hear about that later. But I still remember as a little boy, people telling me how busy the place was and how, it was, how much fun it was. But as I'm finishing here, my part, I should add that uh, most of the research I do for these programs, I get from Hiram Drock's book called uh, Taming the Wilderness. And it's an invaluable source for uh, information and history of our, of our area, especially in the 20th century. And it is available uh, at the Food Chain Museums. <coughs> so now I will give way to Ashley. Okay, so another big component of the nightlife was uh, the theaters and vaudeville and um, the nightclubs, the, the introduction of the drive-in movie theater, um, and uh, social clubs. So those are the things that I'm going to talk about. Um, 
So starting with theater and vaudeville, when we talk about theater, we're talking about two different kinds of theater that are going on during this time. You're talking about um, acting theater and vaudeville, and we're also talking about the motion picture theater. Um, so you're, you have the silent movies, and then you have the introduction of the talkies films, which come in in 1929. Now, going to the theater was a very formal affair. Um, you're not just going to go out in your regular clothes that you would go shopping in. Um, you're going to get dressed up. Women are wearing um, you know, their big fancy hats. They have these signs on the door that said, you know, ladies, please remove your hats so you know, people can actually see the screen um, and things like that. Um, in small rural America, theaters start to pop up because of the advent of the rail system. Um, rail, the, the railroad allows production companies and actors to be able to transport all of their, you know, all of their stage equipment and that kind of stuff. And that made permanent theaters in small towns more feasible. So train travel in International Falls, you get passenger trains that come in in 1907, and then in Rainier in 1908. Um, but they had some local theaters that were uh, established a little bit before that, but the, the bigger theaters that are getting vaudeville acts and things, those don't really become established until 1910, after the completion of the mill. The mill signifies that this area is going to do well, there's a population base here that can support theaters. So the unique theater opens in 1910. Um, business is so successful that in 1911 they add 250 opera chairs um, that they have installed and then they put up a big electric lighted marquee. In May of that same year, the Idle Hour Theater opens. It was in the Stanton Building on 3rd Street. Um, it, it isn't there anymore. And that housed the latest equipment for moving motion picture machines and they had Garwood's Orchestra to accompany accompany those films. The Empress Theater sat 350 people. It uh, was filled every single night that it was open during the first week that they had shows. Um, and they featured vaudeville acts, moving pictures, ragtime, sketch artists, all that kind of thing. Um, so with, with the vaudeville, vaudeville is really interesting um, because it was super common in the late 1900 or late 19th century, early 20th century, and it was notable for heavily influencing um, early film, radio, and then eventually television later on. And the acts were short acts. Um, it included uh, magicians, singers, dancers, trained animals, that kind of thing. Um, names that you would know would be Judy Garland, she started off in vaudeville, Harry Houdini was a famous vaudeville performer, um, and vaudeville was considered light, uh, polite enter entertainment in the beginning, um, but only for a short period of time. As the years progressed, it's, they started to kind of hypersexualize the stage. Um, women started to dress a little um, they didn't have, you know, they didn't really have that many clothes on. <laughs> uh, and th because there was an intrigue with the female figure. And so what it did was, is it turned the female body into a, its, its own sexual spectacle. Um, so this, this marks a time in history for women um, more so than it ever had before. Um, vaudeville gets a little bit hurt by film in 1910, um, but it doesn't die out, especially in areas like Kuchiching. People in Kuchiching really loved vaudeville a lot. They had tons of acts, you'll see lots of ads for them. Um, and what kills vaudeville eventually is sound uh, theater. Um, but it doesn't go away, it actually morphs into what Broadway is now. So why are these theaters important to people in Kuchiching County or rural America? Um, first of all, it's a way they get out of the house. It's you know their entertainment, it's a social aspect, but they're also getting things like the news. Um, these theaters were playing newsreels before the movies, um, before the advent of television or before TV was prominent in homes. And this was the way that these people were getting 
to see, to have tangible visual proof or, you know, to be able to see what's happening in the world, um, like watching the explosion of the Hindenburg or the Olympics. It was also a way that they were spreading propaganda during the war. Um, the Grand Theater promoted a film in 1918 called The Kaiser, The Beast of Berlin. And that was a, a Germanophobic film that contained a lot of propagandist views during World War I. And they actually printed out, uh, they called it the Grand Bulletin, and they put it in the International Falls Press. And people loved that. <laughs> Um, that film is now considered lost. You can't watch it, um, unfortunately. Um, the Grand Theater burned down in 1936, but Frank Keyes had extremely deep pockets, and he decided that he wanted to rebuild because the theater was so important. And he was kind of go big or go home. So he built a giant brick theater. It would seat over 850 people. It included a cry room for mothers with children. It had a circular stage that was large enough for 30 performers. So this theater was catering to, um, you know, acting, but they also catered to motion pictures because he made sure that he had the best equipment for talkies, um, so for, for talkie films. And then by 1940, the theaters decreased down to three. They only had the border, the grand, and the falls, and then that kind of that number continues to fluctuate. Um, moving into the nightclubs and lounges, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of nightclubs and lounges. Some of them people will remember, some of them you may have never heard of. One of them was the Avalon Club. <coughs> this was a high-end club, it was very ritzy fancy club. It was located somewhere on 3rd Avenue in the vicinity near present day Border Bar. Um, we don't really know a lot about it, but we do have some pictures there on our exhibit. Um, another one is the Ritz. That was located across from where the flame was. Um, it's where the, where the outpost is currently now. That's where the Ritz was. Um, I do believe at one point in time it was owned by a, a man named Glenn LaBelle. Um, if that is wrong, and someone knows differently, please feel free to tell me. Um, the PNG that later became the Flame. I'm sure lots of people remember the Flame. And then of course the Williams Nightclub. Um, that was, um, of course, as Mike mentioned, located where the Rainier Post Office is now. They, they were very well known for their food and their floor shows. The women were very popular. Um, they performed some burlesque routines. One of them was called the Balloon Dance. If you don't know what that is, go on YouTube. They have it. It's very fascinating. <laughs> um, and social clubs. Social clubs, they're not really so much an aspect of the nightlife, but they did do some things in the evenings. Um, and there were a million social clubs. There, you know, you have the Order of the Oddfellows, Order of the Eastern Star, Freemasons, the Elks, the Moose, the Rainy Lake Women's Club. Um, but I'm only going to talk about a couple very briefly. One of the clubs was the Oddfellows Club. And the first lodge that they ever had was established in New York in 1806. Um, the founders were three boat builders, a comedian, and a vocalist. And that's kind of how they came up with their, their name, the Odd Fellows. Um, anyone can join this club. It's a fraternal organization. Men and women both can, can join. And this isn't a secret club like the Masons or the Order of the Eastern Star. Um, the Eastern Star, you have to like be related to a Mason to get in. And Masons, you have to be invited. And it's called really weird. If anyone's a Mason, sorry. <laughs> I just think that's... It's really, it's just odd. They wonder why they don't have any members, I don't know. Um, but the Odd Fellows, you, you, anyone can join this. Um, and, you know, they were around to visit the sick, relieve the distressed, bury the dead, and educate the orphan. That's their, that's their motto. Um, they also have a, a group called the Rebecca's. And this, um, men and women could both join the Rebecca's as well. Um, but this group was extremely active in International Falls, and not just International Falls. They had an odd fellows group in Little Fork and Mizpah and um, Big Falls. 
and then they all kind of joined together and formulated one large lodge in 1912, and then they called themselves uh, the Bemidji and Border uh, Odd Fellows Organization. Um, some notable Odd Fellows were Ulysses S. Grant, Charles Lindbergh, P.T. Barnum, Charlie Chapman, and Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. And if you are interested in joining the Odd Fellows, there is a club in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. <laughs> and they do have a calendar online. The other club was the Rainy Lake Women's Club. Um, it was founded in 1929. It was originally called the Rainier Community Club, but it was renamed in 1944. That consisted of the good women, and for a long time, club members had to be homemakers only. You couldn't work. Um, if you wanted to join, they were like, hey, quit your job or retire, and then you can come, come hang out with us. Um, these women originally started the club so they could raise money to put streetlights in Rainier so they could see all of the, the naughty men going into the, the, the brothels and uh, uh, all, all the naughty places and uh, I guess shine light on the bad stuff and then help keep the streets safer. Um, the club also fought to keep the, uh, the Rainier Muni out of the community building. Um, and in 1937, they furnished the kitchen in the community building. And then they did, they did, a, they did a lot of other things, um, a lot of really great stuff. They spearheaded the drive for the junior uh, college, which then, of course, becomes Rainier River Community College. That project began in 1962, and they were responsible for the bike trail. Um, the club, unfortunately, did disband in 2010. And finally, the drive-in theater. Um, the one drive-in theater that I thought was really interesting was the Paul Bunyan drive-in theater that was located on Highway 53 South on the Van Lynn Road. It was built and opened in 1954 on five acres of land, and it was purchased by Eugene and Ellen Tacky um, from Clifford Wagner. Um, they built this theater to accommodate 500 cars, but that was a little crazy. And they only ended up really accommodating between three to 400, um, which was 2,000 people. Um, the screen that they had measured 38 by 48 feet, um, and the screen tower itself was 60 feet. Um, and it was uh, basically five stories. The opening feature that they showed there was a Technicolor film called Branded, starring Alan Ladd. I don't know if anyone's watched that. It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did watch it, um, you know, to see what it was like. Yes. Um, the drive-in was later sold in 1959 to the Elmer Rossi family, and they later renamed that uh, drive-in the Parkway and that opened in 1960. Um, but the drive-in is a really interesting uh, part of the social life um, because it, there's a shift there. There's a little bit more um, family activity going on. People are starting to do more things with their family. Um, and the whole idea of the drive-in theater, um, this is kind of a fun fact, the drive-in theater was created in 1933 by a gentleman named Richard Hollingshead, and he came up with the idea because his mother was too large to fit in the theater seats. So she could fit in the car. So he put her in the car and then put the projector on the hood and then just played a movie for her. And then he was like, hey, this is a great idea, drive-in movie. Thanks, Mom, for being too big to fit in the theater seats. <laughs> so, that's, uh, that's, that's it. That's all you've got? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm done now. I'm done. How long did that one last? How long did that one you know, I'm not sure. I, I tried to find it in all of the phone directories, and I don't know if they didn't have a phone or if they just didn't want people to know <laughs> how to get a hold of them. Text me. Because... Well, the ones that own it, they're, they're all gone now, but uh, that's right beside where Joseph Baker used to be. That was Louis Chippel? 
Okay. Yeah, I went through all of the phone books, all of the directories, and I couldn't find an address for it or phone number. It was not in any any of them. So. Okay. Okay. Wow. Dutch room. We didn't I didn't touch on that. No. Yeah, there's lots of lots of ads and stuff in the newspaper, but no, we didn't we didn't hit on that one. Like I said, there's so many to talk about. What I'm reading this is about dual law, lock evidence of all the stuffed animals. Oh yes. Then they want municipal building. Last they see the stuffed animals is all they have on the all right, Vern, you're up. I think we've lost one. In putting together uh, the talk for this evening, I quickly realized that I know nothing about gambling, not much about whiskey, and almost nothing about women. <laughs> Uh, so I figured that maybe I could just continue a little bit what we did last time on the Radio Lake Aristocracy and some other, other stuff all connected one way or another to whiskey, women, or, or gambling. Uh, I picked up a, a column from Jim Watson who was reading in the Radio Lake Chronicle told of the experience of a young boy with Mary Dalver, the first wife of Gore Dalver. He said, she did like to drink, however, and who doesn't? One night, Bob Lennox and I were sleeping in Oberholzer's bird house. Ober was asleep in the room above us that could be, that could be entered only by a ladder and trapdoor through our room. Mary Dalver and Betty White and two or three other ladies at the time invaded our room and said they wanted to see Ober. But Ober was smart. He put his bed on the trap door and left us to handle the ladies. <laughs> Unfortunately, we were only 12, so I'm sure we botched it. <laughs> I remember as Mary left, she said that Ober was mean and made her sleep out in the cold. I thought he was mean too. I never could understand why he laughed when we told him the next day. <laughs> Another one of the uh, connection with the, the only connection that I have with uh, the ladies tonight was Gilda Glauber at a, um, uh, thought that there was a, they were being overrun at Red Crest with uh, mice. And so she told my father who was caretaking me, and get a cat in town and bring it out. And he didn't like cats very much, and so he didn't do it. And he skipped about three trips to town, and finally she said, you either bring a cat back or don't bother coming back. So that got a little serious. <laughs> so he, he said, um, <clears throat> his next trip to town, on um, there and he started walking back to the boat through the alley behind the city drugstore, which was located at the other end of the block at the time, and spotting what seemed to be a stray cat. They had no down, and with a here kitty kitty and a nice kitty kitty, tried to entice it to come to him. The cat apparently knew nothing, knew how little my father appreciated cats and held back. Finally coming close enough, Dad grabbed it, picked it up, and petted it to calm it. At that moment, a topless lady of the evening stuck her head out of the upstairs window and shouted, Hey, where are you going with my damn cat? <laughs> Dad looked at her softly and said, I'm just a cat lover lady. You don't mind if I pet it, do you? <laughs> she continued to glare at him until he put the cat down, walked down the rest of the block, found an unattached cat and brought it home. <laughs> of all the 
at the top of the list of the unforgettable characters that I had known, but maybe Ben Haskell, I don't know had if you knew him or not. He lived in a cabin at the bottom of Bancroft Bay, had a dog team with which he smuggled goods across the border. He was one of the greatest liars of all time. <laughs> and this is not a derogatory statement, but naming a talent he took great pride in. I remember as a young boy asking him about the fact that his left earlobe was missing. I asked him what happened, and he stated he had gotten into a fight in Bill's bar, and a guy bit it off. I finished by saying, but that's all right, I got it to die out. My father told me later that Ben had lost it to Frostbite while smuggling booze across the border. <laughs> ben was always very good to the Johnson family, and one Christmas, during Prohibition, my father decided to give him a gift of a bottle of whiskey that he knew Ben liked. This was during Prohibition, so Dad had to go to a speakeasy, bought the bottle, wrapped it in a, in a shoe box, and gave it to Ben, who thanked him, opened the box, and said, young fellow, I believe I can trust you. Come with me. He went into his cabin, opened the trap door to show Dad the 200 quarts of the same brand of whiskey that he had smuggled across from Canada with his dog team. <laughs> Just because Ben was a liar, there's no reason to quit telling his stories. One quick one. Ben came home one afternoon from deer hunting, just in time to see a stranger climbing through his window, the window of Ben's cabin. Ben snuck up behind him, goosed him with his rifle, and said, hey, mister, how would you like to have two assholes? <laughs> the man hit the ground running, never to be seen again. There's another story about the kind of Ben was shot and dead for three days, only to make a miraculous recovery, but that's the story from that time. <laughs> I suspect we all have problems with place names in this area. Many islands with three or more names, streets named for long gone structures, etc. I've been referring to Bangkok Day, but you probably all know it as Frank's Day. It's official name on the map. My understanding of how this name changing took place went something like this. A state geographer was staying at Pete Rascoli's Rainy Lake Lodge while uh, codifying local place names. While at the bar one evening, the geographer asked Pete what was the name of the bay that, as there was no name on the map that he had. When Pete realized that the naming rights were available for the day, he shouted across to his handyman, Frank, whose last name I forget. Hey, Frank, would you like to have a bay named after you? Frank said, sure, why not? And so it came to be. You can be sure that some of the locals were upset by this change, but we did not know who Bancroft was either. <laughs> Under, under Minnesota law, the city of International Falls, with its approximately 6,000 population, was permitted to have six on-sale liquor establishments, one per thousand population. But because the tourist population in the summer, the lumberjacks in the winter, the city had successfully convinced the legislature of its need for additional licenses, to a total of about 20. I think Mike said 26, that's probably good too. In 1946, Luther Youngdahl was elected governor of the state of Minnesota, and he came from a strict Lutheran background. His brother was a bishop. And in 1927, when the special legislation came to the desk, he vetoed it. The legislature was unable to override his veto, and the problem became which licenses to in the falls to continue the issue. It turned out the most rational solution was to continue to issue to the oldest establishments. This meant that Bill's bars of Dizzy Bee, Sweet Charlie's were legal, but no upscale watering home was approved. Somebody said if you want anything more exotic, 
put a shot in the beer, you better bring it yourself and bring it make it at home. Although it's hard to know how a small town like the city, like the falls, could bring to retaliate against the governor who would treat, treat them so shabbily, they did come up with a way to, in 1947, daylight saving time became a local option. And for the falls, and the falls was the only city in the state of Minnesota to opt out. I don't know if the governor got the message, but he did create some strange uh, scheduling problems for the people in the falls. We were the only ones. I shouldn't have stayed on that one. You all know what Island View is. After the end of Prohibition, in 1933, uh, the states determined their own regulations concerning the sale of liquor. In Minnesota, it was established that an on-sale liquor license could only be had in incorporated municipalities with a limit of one liquor license per thousand population. However, there was an exception. Any incorporated municipality could have up to three on-sale liquor licenses. In 1940, Bob Cole, the owner of Island View Lodge, thought it was time for him to try to go legal on liquor sales. In order to do this, they would uh, have to form the village of Island View. In order to form a village, there needed to be a minimum of 11 year-round eligible voters. In order to meet this requirement, the village had to be very large. It extended from the Canadian border on the north to, to include Bacchus and Dalbert caretakers, and west to include the Camp Kutchin and Bancroft Bay. Brewer Dalbert, who owned much of the land in the area, including all of the land which is now Golden Shores, was dead set against it, expecting to raise the taxes, and he ordered his caretaker, Don Johnson, to do whatever he could to block it. Instead of blocking it, Don became the first mayor of the newly incorporated village. <laughs> By the way, Mike Williams was the last. Within a few years, there was active, there was active liquor sales at Island View Lodge, Bell Haven, later Thunderbird, and Shea Shea. The creation of Rain Lake Lodge in Bancroft Bay uh, exceeded the three-bar rule, but in future years, the four took turns in operating without a license and no fuss made that I know. The caretaker at the Baptist estate was Harry Robinson, who had been a respected moonshiner during Prohibition. When the revenuer discovered his stash, of whiskey under the woodpile, they invited him to spend the rest the next six months at the federal facility in Duluth. For the rest of his life, Harry referred to this as his vacation. With the formation of the village of Island View, the position of justice of the peace was filled by Harry, as he was the only one in the village who had any experience with the law. Uh, Ashley, has, Ashley has written or has talked about the uh, Green Lake Women's Clubs, and they were formed in 1929. And here, and she also mentioned the liquor store in the in the uh, community building. Here is from my father's journal. 19, uh, January 22, 1951. Lena, my mother, 
along with the Rain Lake Women's Club delegation to Rainier, where they opposed proposal of the village council to put the liquor store in the community building. It must have been a real knockdown, drag out affair, and I for one would just as soon get it second hand. God damn, such a bunch of idiots. <laughs> Rainier has the finest town site in northern Minnesota, but due to their infernal wrangling, it is still a primitive town, with primitive people for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's us. Guys could find their way home. <laughs> 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 